We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. What is up, Cal fans? We are back to record another episode of the Bearcast, a proud partner of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. It is mid to late December, and a lot has happened since we've last been here. But I, of course, am joined by the effervescent. Is that a word? We don't know. Rob, I don't know what that means. I have no idea what that means. What's happening? Is that a good thing? I mean, it's been a while. I looked at the I looked at the recording marker and it's been exactly a month since we recorded. So that tells you how far it's been. But we got a lot to go through. So why why dilly dally with uh, small talk for all our listeners and fans out there? Why don't we get right to it? All right, let's you get ready to it. for this. You ready. ready for this? All, All right. right. Yeah. What do you What do you got? So what What we're talking about today? If you didn't read the uh, title of the podcast episode, is we have coaching hires. Last time we were here, we were talking about speculating about who might come in as the offensive coordinator, who might come in as other um, spots and things, and who might be let go. Um, but now we have our hiring, so we're going to talk about the hirings. Um, I know the transfer portal is in full effect right now. I, we, I do know of all the guys that have left. Um, I know people want us to talk about that, but we're going to record an episode on that next week because we hopefully will have more news and more concrete stuff about who's coming in, who's actually leaving, um, and so on next week. So be on the lookout for that. So for this, it's just we're talking about the coaching hires. We're talking about... Um, what we expect from these hires moving forward and, you know, whether where it stands on our hype level or if it lands somewhere on our DEF CON level. So let's get right through it. Let's get right to it. Um, we got before we talk about the Cal coaching hires, we got to talk about one other coaching hire that was made across the bay at our big rivals with David Shaw leaving. All right. But we got to talk about we got to there. Talk- we got to talk about it because I think we have a lot to talk about about the guys we hired. But, you know, we do have to mention um, the coaching hire that was made at the farm. Troy Taylor, the head coach, former head coach now of Sac State, who lost to, uh, to Incarnate Word, by the way, in an absolutely amazing football game, decided to go for it uh, on fourth down at the end of the game instead of kicking the field goal, a 50-something yard field goal to tie it. Goes for the Hail Mary, does not get it. They lose the Incarnate Word in the FCS playoffs. But after that, he makes it official, joins Stanford. The former Cal quarterback is now the head coach of the Stanford Cardinal. Andy, your thoughts on the new hiring for Stanford? Well, just it's like listening to someone like listening to you trying to articulate that was like (laughs) watching someone try to hold back seasickness. Pretty much. I mean, to the core of it, I I, I genuinely think to some 
not an insignificant number of people, this is like the DEF CON 5. Like whatever, whatever the max <laughs> is there. I think they've seen Dennis Gates come and go as a basketball option and have a ton of success. And I think they're pointing to this example and saying the same, like history is repeating itself. And I don't blame those people that are upset. I can understand where that's coming from. And from my perspective, I'm not terribly worried about it. I genuinely hope that doesn't come back to bite me a year, two or three from now. (laughs) I, I think that it's a good move if you're Stanford and I'm excited that Troy Taylor got paid. Do I think that Troy Taylor remains an option for Cal? Absolutely. I I don't, it's so weird. It's just so weird. Like them introducing Troy Taylor and I, it's just a wild concept. It's conceptually, it's very hard to understand. (laughs) I mean, you're talking, they're talking about his values and all the things that about the team. I'm like, this is a Cal guy. <laughs> this is, <laughs> but yeah, I would love to get your thoughts. Uh, this feels like the, you know, when, remember when Ron Gould was retired at Stanford and then they put out like the yeah. graphics of like all the quarter or the running backs that he's coaching. It's like 90% are guys that have demolished Stanford during the big game. <laughs> like just in all the, it's, they're all wearing Cal like jerseys and stuff on a Stanford graphic. It's just it's it's hilarious to me. And now they're going to have to do that, too, where it's like talking about, you know, hit at some point they'll talk about like him as a as a quarterback, like as a player. And it's going to have a picture. And the Stanford head coach is a former player of their bitter rivals across the bay. Like it's just just the the, the poetic humor <laughs> in all of this is going to be so great. Like and it's if if we beat Stanford, right, it, it'll just be look. Troy Taylor's helping us out. <laughs> he's he's trying to burn the program down from within. He's our Manchurian candidate, but for Stanford as a head coach. If if we lose to them, it's just it's utter chaos. Utter chaos. Abs- absolutely utter chaos. If, if um, you think the message boards are bad now. <laughs> yeah, wait till we lose to Stanford and Troy Taylor is the head coach. Oh my goodness. That I think will yeah. set everything on fire metaphorically and maybe pos- quite possibly literally we just don't know we just don't know i i will say like what you said i think was perfect like this isn't uh this is an end all scenario you know like if let's say let's say for the like a thought experiment right like i, I let's say like nick saban was a cal grad and we and like he ends up going to Stanford instead. I think with his coaching pedigree and that sort of name, sure, I think it's it'll, it's it sucks more for everyone. But we don't know honestly what Troy Taylor is going to be as a Power Five head coach. Like, just if we think about it rationally, it's just as much a a gamble hire for Stanford as it would have been if we hired him this cycle. Like, we know of what he could produce like on the field as an offense coordinator, but we have no idea if he can recruit at the level that's necessary to succeed here, we just, we just don't have enough data. Right. And that's why I, if I'm going to look at this as a positive thing and a positive uh, happening, then look, we're going to find out if Troy Taylor is a power five head coach without having to risk it on our dime. Like we won't have to, if, if he, if he doesn't work out as a, as a power five head coach in the next three years, then we might have dodged a bullet there. If he succeeds, then great. You know, we know he's a viable option. If we end up moving on from Wilcox or if Wilcox ever moves on from us and we just make a phone call down the freeway and across the bridge and say, look, do you want to come home? And the lure of that, I think, is going to be just as good. And I'm sure at that point, if he's if he's succeeding – I'd be hard pressed to say that the donors wouldn't pony up the cash to bring him home. Considering that we're already starting to, you know, up the ante in terms of our finances now. So 
I feel like it's a win-win situation for us. It's just going to suck in a game-to-game basis if we lose to them in the big game. But outside of that, like, yeah, I don't – I'm not that upset. <laughs> I mean, if we had botched our offensive coordinator hire, I think I would be more upset. But I don't think we botched our offensive coordinator hire, so. I agree. We can segue into that in a sec. I mean, I think that there's definitely – more of a sense of it's been weird because this this season was four and eight and abysmal in the Pac-12 and just a lot of disappointment and normally you would expect to have just doldrums going on about the program and I'm sure there's people that do feel that way but I have not felt that because of how the offseason went and understanding that the financial investment and the NIL collective that's been put together for Cal is actually in a much stronger position than maybe we knew. And maybe we gave credit for like that has shifted my perception of all of this. Yeah. And because, because of the fact that like Wilcox is that guy that can go out and I, th- I personally think he can go out and recruit. I think he has a lot of energy for it. I think he reps the university well. And we're in a different era. You know, I don't think they give, I don't think they care at all about this class, this recruiting class. I mean, they care about it somewhat, right? It's like, yeah. but these high school guys, I think it's like the era is now the portal. The era is now NIL. Like, and all of a sudden we're kind of, I'm kind of looking at that and saying, huh, that's a, it's a different equation that we're playing in and Stanford also has to adapt to that. And, that, and, and they haven't yet. And they haven't. And so all of a sudden we're kind of ahead. And I think it's one of those things with Troy Taylor, where even if he has like middling success, you could also make the case that that's good for Cal because they could also hire him there then and say that he, he wasn't equipped with the things that he needed to win. Yep. And there's a reason why David Shaw essentially quit <laughs> yeah i mean i i hate to say that it's like he's not he doesn't deserve that like he he decided to end a legendary career is the right way of putting that but the flip side of it is the dynamic of in the landscape of college football for those that still aren't seeing it for whatever reason is dramatically different than it was two years ago and Cal seems to be in a better position, un- believe it or not, than Stanford at adapting to that new landscape. And so will Troy Taylor be someone that can help them navigate it? Yes, but the complexity that exists there is generally closer to the complexity that we've been dealing with. And we have somebody that's been operating within it for a much longer period of time. And so all of this to say, and we can use this as the segue now, Like, I agree with the hire that we made at Offensive Coordinator we're in a good spot to I think play in this modern era. And I'm super excited about Cal football, <laughs> which is no <laughs> surprise to anybody. But uh, I can't wait for I won't see any of spring ball, but I can't wait for it to start up this fall. I think it's so strange. I never thought I would have adapted that fast. To that positive of a mindset after such a downer of a season. But let's talk about the offensive coordinator hire, Rob. So let's go through that first. All right. So we started, we're going to, a few hirings were made, but we're going to start with the offensive coordinator hire. So on December 6th, um, Pete Thamel tweets out, Cal expected to hire Jake Spavel as the new offensive coordinator. He's the former coach at Texas State and longtime OC quarterback coach. Of course, people who remember him was the one-time Cal coordinator in 2016 in Sonny Dykes' final tenure here. Cal's offense in 2016 was uh, 22nd in the country, averaging 37.1 points per game on 86.3 plays per game. They also had um, a yards per play of 5.9. The Bears finished in the top 15 on offense for both yards per game, total yards, yards per play, and touchdowns. that of offense was, of course, led by Davis Webb, who ended up being a third-round draft pick by the New York Giants. Webb finished the season with 4,295 yards, 61.6% completion, with 37 touchdowns to 12 interceptions. 
Chad Hansen and D-Rob, of course, were the focal point of that passing offense. Hansen exploded onto the scene with 1,249 yards on 92 catches with 11 touchdowns. D-Rob had 50 catches for 767 yards and seven touchdowns. Um, he After Cal, he went on to be the OC at West Virginia, um, who at that time, their head coach is now Houston head coach, but uh, former head coach Dana Holgerson. Uh, after two years in Morgantown, West Virginia, he was named the head coach at Texas State. He would go 13 and 35 at Texas State before he was relieved of his duties after the 2022 season. Andy, your thoughts on Spav's return, the second coming of Jake Spavital. Spav 2.0. Truly. Truly. I am really excited i think that this is sort of the dream that this is mike williams dream that we're living in (laughs) where mike williams was like can we take this sunny dykes offense and pair it with the justin wilcox defense i think that there is a lot behind I, i mean the what you just read from like the receiver standpoint if i'm j mike if i'm jeremiah hunter and like Lord knows it was important to keep those skill guys. And at this point with the the risk of jinxing them, it looks like we're keeping them. And this is a hire too, that it sounded like, you know, coach Wilcox has done a really good job of building trust in his program. And I think there was a lot of trust with his team and with his players in making this hire. Um, And, and sort of saying like, I hear you, I understand what you're looking for. And, you know, this is definitely somebody that is capable with Wilcox, who I'm referring to, of looking at themselves and reflecting and saying, hey, I need to change. And I think that this hire is an example of that, yep. because what you could have done is you go out and hire Paul Christ and you continue to lean into this mold of we're going to be Wisconsin of the West, which I still <laughs> I still think if we had just, you know, if you could recruit, I don't know. I, I'm not totally sure if it's possible anymore, but like, especially because it clearly like didn't work, but like, I understand why you might want to do that. And so I wouldn't have been terribly upset if he had just leaned back into it and said, well, you know, we had some issues with our own line coach. We had some issues with a coordinator and, maybe if we just like fix those two things, then everything will fall into place. And, you know, we can prove out sort of this vision I have. I think it takes a really big person to say, okay, that isn't going to be the plan. The way I originally thought about this isn't going to be the way that I'm going to have success here. I need to hundred percent step back and reconsider my entire approach. And that's what I look at this hire as being. And that's why I'm so excited about it. And then you add in the additional fact that like Spav has got quite the quarterback, uh, however you want to say it, like pedigree. record pedigree. There's an opportunity here to also up level the skill of the players on the offensive side of the ball. We haven't seen that yet in regards to the transfer portal, but it's early in in that sense. And so I think like, I don't know, all of a sudden I look at this and I'm like, I'm I, as I said before, it's just like I'm in on this. I think this is the right the right way to go. Mm-hmm. This is what we all talked about. Could we ever see an era where Wilcox would lean more into a modern style of offense? And here we go. Let's see what it's like. I think you br- you bring up some really good points. I think the first thing is just the the self-reflection, you know, like coach talks about all the time, right? They talk about how they do self-scouting. Um, they, they do all of that stuff, but like, like here's, so from that point, like, let me go back and, and rehash some of my thoughts. The first thing is the playbook and what Bill Musgrave and what they were trying to do offensively wasn't the issue. I think it's a, it's that style of playbook works. Um, it's clear that you can make that work in college football. The only, 
the only difference is you one you needed to recruit an offensive line that's capable of maintaining the production level needed for that type of playbook and two a guy who can play call that playbook efficiently enough to change it up if it wasn't going to plan that was the biggest issue with this playbook like if everything's firing on all cylinders we saw what happens which is the Arizona game like that's that's what you get when everything is firing right the offensive line is getting the blocks they need the runs are happening right they're building off the play action the deep ball's working when everything is firing on all cylinders we know that playbook can work um that's the only issue we had with the past regime now for him to go and get a he's not an air raid like coach per se it's not full air raid um but to get a guy who's like a bit more pass savvy than either of the two previous coaches that you brought in is definitely what you said it's a full-on look I don't think the landscape allows me to recruit the way I want to recruit or develop guys the way I want to develop. So what are we going to do? We're going to lean into what works in college football, where the, the, where the most assets that you can accrue are available, which is at the skill positions, which is at, you know, pass heavy um, types of concepts. And we're going to work with the offensive line type of recruiting that we're able to get in. And most likely in that sense, it's going to lead to quick passing type of offense and getting guys in this space. That's, that's what we're going to do. Um, So you bring in a guy like Spav to do it. Now, what you were talking about with Wilcox and the, just maybe his charisma or whatever you want to call it to maintain guys or bring in guys like that's clear cut, right? Like the guys that have entered the portal off the roster so far have not been, like holy crap we're losing him type of guys um the fact that i mean we'll talk about next week but like that running back room changed drastically now with cardwell coming in as the number two guy right behind and i don't even want to say he's the number two guy behind ott like i think it's it's genuinely a 1a 1b situation here there's no way he's coming in if they're not guaranteeing him like how he's going to play. They're not They're not saying you're the number two guy. They're saying, look, we're going to give you as many opportunities as we give Ott. You'll be on the field in terms of snap count just as much. Like, we're going to give you the opportunity to make plays. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a conversation for next week. And then you look at the wide receiver group and who we lost. Barely anybody. We kept all our starters. And then you look at the tight end group and you're like, all right, who did we lose? Latu, okay, I get that. But we didn't lose Terry. And we bring in a kid like, Ben Marshall, who the more I watch his tape, the more I love. Um, and of course the quarterback position, that that's a question mark. Like, you know, we, you know, we lost plumber. Um, it looks like we're losing Kai. And that's like, that's a push right now, just because we don't know who we're bringing in. That'll, that'll determine like how this ends up. If we end up upgrading through the portal, then that's a totally different conversation here. But I think you and I are, are on the same page and we trust Spav. Like he, they brought, he's one of the reasons they brought in Davis Webb. Yep. And look what happened. Like all of the quarterbacks he's developed. And like, you know, one of the quarterbacks he coached at Texas A&M, Kenny Hill is now a grad assistant here. Right. Like I think there's, there's a bit of help here um, and track record that I think we can trust the decision-making in terms of that. Um. In terms of like how the hiring was made, like I know you and I both hear things. You and I both have things that we're allowed to talk about, things that we're not allowed to talk about. Um, I think the general thing that people wanted to know is like the timeline of this, which I can speak to. Like, I think the everyone was upset. Like, why aren't we making this hire faster? Why is it taking so long? It took nearly like a week and a half to make this hire. I think, and then why did we end up with Spav? Um, I think it was all timing. I think it was, from what I understand, like we had guys that we wanted. I think Spav was on the list. Spav at that point was not available. So we moved on to other options. Those options did not work out. And then by the time those options not did not work out, Spav was available again. And then so we circled back. So would you really call that a backup option if, if that if that's how it played out, which is how I understand it to have played out? 
Probably not. I think Spav might have been the number one or number two guy they wanted. Just, you know, life is about timing, right? And it just so happened a week and a half ago, he was unavailable. And then a week later, it's it's possible that this could work. So that's kind of how the timeline went from my understanding of it. And now we have Jake Spavel coming back. Um, I think that the second thing before I, ask, before I toss it back to you again, I think the big thing that people were asking, and remember Nam when we had Jake as our head coach, his whole thing was run the damn ball, Jake. Um, Yes. Like I'll look at the splits, right? Like we averaged um, rushing wise. uh, Let's see. Where's our splits. Um, So our attempts rushing on offense was about 34.5 and our passing attempts was about 51.8. That was back in, that was back in 2016, right? But if you if you go and look at Spav's uh, play calling and splits when he was at Texas State, that actually balances out pretty close to 50 50. Um, so if you're worried about him not running the ball and being pass heavy, I don't think that's an issue. I think the the run thing was more of a sunny thing back then than it was a, a Spav thing. But your any thoughts on what I just talked about? I missed that run the bit, run the damn ball, yeah, Jake. But then Nam just did it for Bill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It came back. It came back full circle. It came back. We're driven by the search for better, but when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search. Match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Yeah, I think there's no way Jaden Knotts stays in this with this program with the way that college football is right now if there wasn't some assurances around what the you know, the run pass balance is going to look like. Yeah. I, I also think that him in space as a receiver is just gonna be I look like almost at like Austin Eckler, you know, like the modern NFL wrist running back is also yep. now like Christian McCaffrey. Like they're really good receivers in addition to running the football. Yep. And so you're talking about just like, once again, like we're back, like talking about a, a, a very like modern style of offense. It's just going to be so exciting to, to be able to expect more from the offensive side of the football. Truly. And I, I still maintain that like, the this uh, this greater idea of Wilcox somehow it's still out there somehow that Wilcox is like holding back this offense. I I just am excited. I, I think the biggest question that I have will be what is the impact of the offense on the defense? Yep. And does that impact Sermon and Wilk? Does it exp- even some people would say does it expose Sermon's side of the ball that wasn't that good this last year? And we've certainly added talent there, but I, I'm curious. I think that's like my big question going into this is like, okay, so now we're going to adapt to this, but like, what does that do to you defensively? How does that impact, you know, the uh, first to 21 style? Because it's very <laughs> different, right? It is. Our goal would be to never give a shit if someone got to 21 and be like, we can bounce back from that. We could come back from 33 0. Allah. <laughs> oh man. Allah the Colts. RIP Matt Ryan. So 
I'm really excited about it. I mean, I run the run the damn ball. I agree. I don't, I don't know if you can bring in a talent like Cardwell without like we know that his number one in that article that he put out, like why he transferred. The yep. quote was literally, "I wasn't getting playing time." Yep. So you know what the dude wants. <laughs> it's right there, and I'm sure that they came in and said, "Yeah, we're going to give you that playing time." I would hope that they would look at some of the two running back sets that Kyle is doing with the Niners and uh, what LaFleur is doing with the Packers that used to seem to work and it's not working as much. Uh, but with like what AJ Dillon and Aaron Jones are doing, that there's an opportunity to kind of do that and just like use split back looks. I think that's really exciting to me because that's the style that I would hope we would play. And then how you involve your tight ends and Jer- they take advantage of Jermaine Terry in space. That's yeah. that's the thing. Like air raid is like getting the ball to skill players in space, and I just am excited for guys like Jermaine Terry. That like I've seen like six people try to tackle that guy and they can't do it, <laughs> and yet we just really haven't seen that progression from him. Yeah, uh, not not necessarily his. It's not his fault. Uh, but because of the way the offense was working, it just never really felt like we were featuring our tight ends. Like I don't blame Latu for being like, I'm going to go search elsewhere. And he's got like siblings out there because I, I also felt like we underutilized him. He was such a mismatch. Yep. And we just never leaned into it as much as I thought he would become our JJ or Sega white side. Kind of in that field. Yeah. I, you know what, I, you bring up a really good point. I, you know, the, the whole offense defense, like just the amount of snaps and plays you're going to have to do, right? Like I, I'll, I, I was talking about the play splits between the passing and rushing, but like total offense, right? In 2016, the bears ran 86.3 plays per game, uh, versus defensively 77.3. Just this past season for Cal offense runs 65.4. And the defense runs 73.6. So if the defense holds, that's about one extra three and out that you probably are holding for. Offensively, you gain 20 plays. <laughs> Which, that sounds enticing. <laughs> if it's that explosive too, right? 20 plays is so many. <laughs> 20 plays is a lot. It's absolutely a lot. It's actually like two long Two pretty decent drives that could take yeah. up most of the field. Yeah. So that's the, that I think that's a valid question now is like what, you know, the, we know the offensive plays are going to increase because the tempo is going to go up, which means we're also going to get probably more three and outs. You know, I'm, I'm sure that's going to bring PTSD to people, but like just in the grander scheme of things, because we're running so many more plays, we're getting more drives, which means there are going to be drives that stall out faster than, you know, just like the, just a percentage game right um it might feel like we're getting more but percentage of total drives wise it's probably going to be less uh, let's look ahead let's look ahead but like how does that impact the defense because that means the defense is going to be out on the field a lot more right because look if an offense is explosive it's the same concept like if you go three and out the defense is still on in in three plays if you score on three plays the defense is still on the field after three plays. You're not really giving the defense the time up. What you are giving them is the, the gap in points. Yeah. But so that's something to be excited about and protect. Right. Yes. But at the same time, like from a, from just a football watching perspective, look, that, that becomes the sunny deal of like, it's a, it's the first to whoever can get a stop because the defense is out there so often <laughs> they're just exhausted and the, the points just keep going up and you're just like the defense just needs to hold for one drive and that'll win us the game. That's what I like. I mean, I think it's risky. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Wilcox is impresses me with his ability and willingness to take risks to accomplish great. Yeah. And when he could clearly settle for he could settle. We know that he can settle. Like, let's be honest. Let's all be honest right now. We have a basketball coach who has won, thanks to last night, one game. One game. What are we, one in 13 or one in 14? 12. One in 12. Okay. I was overdoing it. Yep. 
Well, it'll be one in thirteen and fourteen probably in a couple weeks. But all right, so we'll be there in a couple <laughs> Fair weeks. Enough. Yeah, he has not been fired. <laughs> so if I'm Wilcox and I'm looking at that, I'm like, there's employees that are pro striking. This university is, you know, there's a lot going on. I have an AD who is currently, we have a swim coach who is under investigation, an AD who is tied to that investigation, and a basketball coach who is proving that at 1 in 12, your job is secure. He doesn't have to take a risk here. It would be very easy to not take a risk and say, well, all right, I don't want to make a drastic change. I don't want to see my starting quarterback that passed for like 3,300 yards and looked pretty damn good transfer out. I can just like run it back and like win another six games, cash another check and be in the good graces of, you know, some of the donors and, you know, my AD who's got other real stuff that's facing them. Yep. But instead, it's not that at all. Like this dude is a competitor he obviously wears it on his face every press conference it's not always a strength but it is something that i have continuously appreciated about wilcox he yep. wants to win and he doesn't just want to win he wants to be great and this is an opportunity for us to be great now there's our schedule is not good next year <laughs> it's not any it's not doesn't get any easier it's not great i mean north texas is at, at north texas for opening, that is going to be interesting. And then we play Auburn at home. And then, uh, you know, Idaho at home. Which I I don't know. Like, Idaho, like, maybe like that's an easy game. I don't know. <laughs> I'm scared to say. Fingers crossed. And then Arizona State with Dillingham. So you're like, okay, like, should be a pretty strong offensive program. They've gotten a couple of our guys to grad transfer there. Then you get Oregon State, USC, Washington no State. Walks. Yeah, Washington State is no. like the first one where I'm like, okay. And then right after that, you go with Oregon. And then Stanford, UCLA, Utah, and Washington. That has <laughs> to be like, <laughs> this is this is not good. Not, not good. And I do not want to be on this podcast being an apologist for the schedule <laughs> next year. No, I do not. And maybe that's it, dude. Maybe if it is, it's like, well, if you played it conservatively, you were going to get whooped in this schedule. Like this schedule Absolutely. is like, this yeah. is a crazy schedule. You might have had to go risk heavy here. Like it's, it's just, it's, that's just how the cards felt. Like that's why, that's why I, I'm not going to put a much gauge on like this high school recruiting class because clearly, you know, they whiffed on a few guys and didn't secure signatures. But at the same time, they're holding back and not offering, you know, guys that were maybe tier two, tier three on their recruiting list because they're going to go heavy in the portal. Mm -hmm. I think this is the year, like, especially with the guys that we retained, this is an easy sell job for a lot of guys, right? We didn't get the five-star defensive lineman from Texas A&M. I know that sucks, but one, there's going to be a lot more guys that enter the portal over the next week and a half. And two, there's also going to be a bunch of guys that enter the portal after spring ball. It's a, it's a, if you can, if you can strike here, you have a very good chance of turning around your roster into a very, very talented one in a matter of months. Yeah, we, yes, ex exactly. The dynamic, the dynamic has shifted. And we've been we've proven out through other programs. Like, look how many teams in the Pac-12 are breaking in new quarterback this year. Yep, it's like every damn team. Same Washington, with us too. Yeah. Washington State. Well, I mean, yeah, us too. It's like Washington, Washington State. So both Washington schools, Oregon, then Cal, not Stanford, U.S. Not Oregon State, not Oregon State. Yep, USC. Yep. Arizona, Arizona, Arizona State, Arizona State, not Utah, but like Colorado. Don't know about Colorado. Kind of, kind of. <laughs> Overwhelmingly, 
Yeah. Was it's it like, like nine out of twelve? Yeah. If it's not nine out of twelve, it's eight. Like yeah. eight out of twelve. I mean, it's overwhelmingly and those teams that did were pretty successful. Plumber was pretty successful. Yeah. I know people. Some there's not he's not universally looked at as being successful, but like I think Plumber was a pretty successful grad transfer quarterback. Considering how much he got plummeled <laughs> into the ground. Yes. He was very successful. Great word choice there. Yeah. You've had Wendy's nugs dipped in sauce, but have you had them covered in sauce? Wendy's new saucy nugs take the crispy and spicy nugs you love and turn them up to 11. Choose between flavors like buffalo or honey barbecue, garlic parm, or if you're a real heat seeker out there, you can try spicy ghost pepper only on Wendy's signature spicy nugs. Listen, I'm going to dare you to do it. I dare you. That's seven delicious ways to try the nugs that you already love. Pick a flavor, grab some extra napkins, and then grab a few more napkins and prepare to nug like you've never nugged before. For a whole new way to nug, it's got to be Wendy's at participating U.S. Wendy's. Yeah, I, I this... This hire excites me, and I'm very excited now to see what spring ball bring, brings. Because the moment we get out there, like the first week's not going to be that fun, but come like week two, week three, when they're starting to install a bit of the offense, and we see start to see the concepts that Spav is going to want to run. I'm very curious as to like how that runs against a defense that's actually pretty experienced now. Like everyone we brought back on defense, like has played this past year. So how they run, like I tweeted this out as soon as like Spav was hired, right? Our whole mental gymnastics and like um, NCAA, like uh, what's it? Experiments that we ran in our head of what would a Sonny Dyke slash Spavel <laughs> offense look like with a Justin Wilcox defense, right? We're getting that this year. It's no longer a thought experiment. Like it's, it's happening. In next year, when we kick off against North Texas, that's exactly what's happening. That play, those two playbooks and those two play styles will collide on the field and be under the one banner of Cal football. <laughs> that's exciting. That's exciting. That in that alone should be exciting for you. Truly, I, I yeah, I agree hundred percent. Couldn't have couldn't have said it any better. Let's talk about some of the other guys that we brought in, right? So not, not only did we bring in Spav, but uh, we did bring in two more guys. So, of course, we let go of Angus McClure. The surprise here is that we let Jeep go. Um, I didn't think Jeep was terrible. I didn't think he was great, really, either. I don't think he was really any big part of the, the problem, um, per se, on the offense. Uh, but we did decide to make that move. So on, on the offensive line, we bring in Mike. I'm not, I'm going to butcher his last name. Bloch. Uh, he's also given the tag of run game coordinator. He was the offensive coordinator quarterbacks coach for North Texas, who we play <laughs> to start off the season next year. He was at North Texas for three years, was the offensive coordinator quarterback, offensive, co- uh, offensive coordinator, offensive line and co-offensive coordinator offensive line. Before that, he was the offensive line coach at Tulsa for uh, for about three, four years. Before that, he was at Houston as an analyst. And before that, he coached uh, high school football in Texas as an offensive coordinator at Temple High School and also won a uh, District 8, 5A um, high school championship. So definitely tenured. The the key for his hire is you got to look at North Texas's offensive line over the last few seasons particularly last year and it's honestly the stuff rate which is the biggest one the stuff rate for north texas sat at 14 percent, which is ranked for 21st in the country what that means is when uh, what the stuff rate looks at is when a running back or the runner is hit behind the line of scrimmage only on 14 percent of those situations was a runner hit behind the line of scrimmage. If that doesn't excite you while we're handing the ball off to Ott or Cardwell, <laughs> that's, I don't know what to say. Uh, that's, that's probably the, the most exciting part about this entire hire. 
your thoughts, Andy, on our new offensive line coach. I like it. I mean, I think that he has had a, a lot of success at North Texas. Like, and I think there's going to, I don't want to, I've got to be careful here because I, I think there's going to be some stuff that comes out that Peter does that is going to go into it more. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm just, I'm pretty up. Opti- I think we've made good hires. Yep. Like they had a lot of success. And to your point, I think it's, there's something that you can kind of pin your pin like bookmark and come back to and say, Hey, like there's a reason to be excited for this. Um, and it's also just like, I think a, generally a good thing when you can hire someone that's an offensive coordinator into yep. a position like O-line coach and run game coordinator. Yep. I'm all for it. I think it's, I think it's a great move. I mean, I don't, I don't know, but I, it's got to be better than Angus. <laughs> that's what we come down that's what we come back to it's it's got to be better than what we had <laughs> it just it just has to be like yeah just has I, to be i think the the one anecdote before we move on to the new tight end coach i think is the texas connection here i think bringing in an offensive line coach um who has ties to texas along with spav who's the new oc that has ties to texas and then you look at the rest of the offensive staff and in the everyone else has ties to California. I think it's clear where they want to hit in terms of the recruiting trail. Like they're going to hit California hard and they're going to hit the Texas, the entire state of Texas hard. And then Pacific Northwest of course is covered by guys like Sermon and Wilcox. So I think this is a great hire, not just from a stats and like advanced analytics perspective, but also the recruiting ties perspective. And of course, I think you said it best. If any time you can quote unquote demote a guy in terms of their role and still bring him in is a big, big time move. Big time move. All right. Next one. Uh, we bring in the new tight end coach is Tim Plow. I think that's, I think that it's just, <laughs> I think that's how you say his name. Um, which it if, is, if it is Plow, what a great like offensive, like offensive line or tight end coach, like type of last name, right? Um, but this one's pretty, this one's a good one too. He was, he's now brought in as the tight end coach, but he was the offense coordinator quarterbacks coach at Boise state last year, uh, was, and also the year before that he was the associate head coach and offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach at UC Davis in 2020, um, and 2019 and 2018 and 2017. Of course, UC Davis, the head coach, uh, towards the early part of his tenure there is Ron Gould before he made the switch over to Stanford, uh, Northern Arizona, uh, before that as the offensive coordinator, uh, quarterbacks coach, and also coaching wide receivers. And then before that also was at UC Davis from 2008 to 2012. I feel like our strategy is to acquire offensive coordinators. Yeah. We have three. Yeah. I don't think Wilcox wants to be in a situation <laughs> where if he has to fire someone, there's no one with offensive coordinator experience <laughs> again. <laughs> That might be what this move is. That clearly might be what this move is. First, um, we acquire all the offensive coordinators. Then we win the Pac-12. <laughs> you know what's also you know on top of that, I you know that's a good point because on top of that, all three guys, including Spav, has been a quarterback coach at some point. <laughs> I, is it clear that they know the position of need and yeah. where it needs to be developed? Yeah. <laughs> I know it's like every person that's like Wilcox hasn't developed a quarterback in six years. It's like, well, I think he heard you. <laughs> <laughs> you got three guys that have developed quarterbacks. Have you worked with a quarterback? Okay, good. Have you worked with a quarterback? Good. I just can't wait to see that and be like, okay, hold your arm this way. No, no, no. Hold your arm this way. Do it a little bit like this though. <laughs> like, oh my god. <laughs> you got three coaches overlooking your shoulder, looking at your game yeah. tape and telling you what you gotta do. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, goodness. Um but yeah, I mean, look, uh, Peter in his uh, in the post that he wrote, he got it. I think he got it from Football Outsiders. Uh, Boise State and their offense uh, ranked in the top eighty, and so if you can get that type of actually, sorry, uh, offensive ranking is seventy uh, fourth, so top seventy five. 
questions now become when he was at Boise State, how much of that was Andy Avalos, you know, who is former Oregon office coordinator who became or no. Yes. Yes. Am I right? Yeah, I mm-hmm. am right. Okay. Um, so now he's never coached tight ends before. So that's a big question mark here is how well will tight end development go if he's never coached that position. But clearly the dude is willing to change up positions um, as long as he's somewhat part of the offensive coordinating um, group. And I, you know what? I honestly, I think that's the big key here that I think people are going to miss is remember what happened at the end of the year, right? They went with an offensive coordinating group by committee in terms of the game planning. Um, I think it's clear if you watch some of the replays, like it's Jeep who's actually calling the plays. But as a preparation standpoint um, and at halftime adjustment, they went as a group. I think that's kind of what he's going for here. I think Spav is the guy who's going to call plays. He'll be the main guy. But I think in terms of the game planning, you got two other guys who have offensive coordinator experience. You're going to lean on them in terms of the game prep and what they see. And if you got three guys and if that if that works – and you have three guys all on the same page, and you also bring three different perspectives of how they see the game, and they look at, you know, one guy might notice something that the defense is doing from his perspective that the two other guys might not have, and that gives us an edge, I'm all for it. Absolutely all for it. And I think that's kind of what they're going for here. I agree. I agree. I mean, I think the one of the things that excites me about Plow if that's the right name <laughs> <laughs> is that it is. he coached three offensive linemen who earned like all conference honors. Yep. And yeah, I think you're talking about your concerns. Correct. I think, is it like, but this is, you know, is it someone that's going to be able to translate it to just coding, coaching tight ends? Uh, but I think there's a lot of other areas that somebody like that can add value to. So yep. it's almost like looking at, it's almost like taking the approach that the giants take dare. I mention the giants right now, but <laughs> um, the giants take with like positional players that can, you know, play like every single infield position and, and also sometimes outfield as well. Yeah. And like understanding that there's value in that and that having people that are like, have that balance, like the fact like our tight ends coach also has experienced coaching wide receivers to an yep. all conference level. Also, I was experienced coaching offensive linemen to an all conference level. Like our O line coach and run game coordinator will have experience coaching quarterbacks. Like all of that will be super helpful because I think you're totally right. You bring those minds in a room and you're going to see far more than I think if you sometimes, maybe if you're super, super specialized, like you really can only see your lane. And I, I'm interested to see if it works. Like, I don't know. I'm not saying like, I just think that at, from conceptually as a theory, it's actually quite interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, we talk about versatility of players on the field, right? I think it's rarely talked about, about versatility of coaching staffs. And this is going to be a very, this is going to be a very cool experiment to see if this pans out. Cause if the offense automatically starts firing come next year at North Texas, then it's going to be clear cut. Like, the gambles paid off. This is going to work. And now how do we retain all of these guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and truly. That's such a good problem to have. So I hope we yeah. have that problem. Yep. But that's it. Those are the three guys that we hired. And now we have a new offensive system. We have a new offensive line coach. We have a new tight ends coach. We have a new quarterbacks coach. And it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out, not only in the portal, but come spring ball. And um, how the development of these guys work. I'm very interested to talk to these coaches too. They're gonna, they're going to be fun to talk to. I I do feel like th- I I mean this the best way possible, but there's going to be some serious hype coming out of your fall camp reports. Fall camp reports or spring ball reports? I feel like there's going to be super hype in in spring ball. Yeah, but like spring, you can't be that excited because you're like, oh, it's still spring. Like I don't know. True. You have to hold back. I want yeah, yeah, yeah. the unadulterated like no strings attached (laughs) it's just gonna be like uh it's gonna be so good like Like, imagine if we like bring in like let's say like a a former like high four star five star like quarterback or some other some other like offensive lineman autumn automatically the (laughs) the hype levels just skyrocket and engage to you know the stratosphere 
and yeah, I think that's a good point to close out on. It's, it, it really, there, the defense that we are returning and everyone like remember that we get Brett Johnson back. Yep. And, and, and Stanley McKenzie back. Stanley McKenzie. And then we're adding Sergio Allen yep. from Clemson. Like, and, Sir, and Sermon's coming back. Like Sermon's back. There's, we haven't, and we added two solid or three solid DBs yep. into the mix. Noel and Williams. it was cool to also hear like that we look at that and look at those ads and say, you know, Hey, like, I mean, I think a lot of people have said is sermons defense part of the problem. Like they're looking at that objectively and saying, Hey, can, can we change this? Can we get better? I wouldn't have thought you needed to bring in three new DBs, but <laughs> like the fact that they can see that and address that need and know what it allows them to do differently than what they did this last season is important. But you're talking about a unit that is returning a ton. Like Carlton has another year, right? Carlton's back too. I mean, already like depending on how we plug in Sergio Allen here, like this is a very talented defense that should have high expectations on it. So once again, we come into the same equation that we find ourselves in year in, year out, which is can the offense get to the point where it can score 30 to 35 points a game? If it can, eight wins become possible. If it cannot, four wins become possible. <laughs> well, here we are. And that's, that is, there is, there is a beauty to that in the sense like you're never really out there's no way I think you could look at this team and our staff and what that and be like, Oh, this team isn't, I mean, breaking a brand new quarterback is certainly a little stressful, but now that you have the right hire in place, as you're saying, like somebody with a pedigree, somebody that you Rob look at and you say, okay, I have trust in this individual. They have clear results in the past. This isn't someone that we hired from the NFL that has never coached in college football, football before. This is someone that has succeeded in the space in which they've hired them in the space in which we've hired them from and has the record to prove it. All right. You know, do you, do you start to build the hype? That's what we're here for. That's what the bear cast is. The hype. It's just a hype building <laughs> machine. We just, we just nonstop build hype. That's, that's what we're here for. Um, yeah, but that's a good place to end it because, you know, next week we'll come back and we'll talk about the transfer portal and everything that's, happened with that so far the ins uh the guys that have entered the portal from our end the guys that have exited the portal into berkeley hopefully there's some more names that we can talk about um but it is interesting there are a few name more names out there there are going to be a lot more names out there that are going to be tied to us that you could kind of look at uh with very interesting eyes i think the qb position with two guys leaving now it gets very more it gets a lot more interesting especially if you keep all the skill guys and now you yeah, have an opportunity to, I don't want to say upgrade. Cause I, I think you and I both agree. Jack was great. Uh, but you have a chance to, to infuse some, some new names and some new talent into that room. So we'll see how that plays out over the next uh, week and a half. Dual so, threat, dual threat, baby. That's what Andy wants. That's what Andy really wants, but I'm not sure if that's the, the, the style that they're looking for, but uh, I digress. If you want us to, if you want to talk about or like put out some names out there, don't don't uh, hesitate to tweet at us at Golden Bearcast. Of course, that's where you can find us on Twitter. You can find, you can email us about anything you want us to talk about. Uh, GoldenBearcast at gmail .com. and you can find all, all the written stuff for from us at WriteForCalifornia.com. And I think that's it. And if you're listening to this uh, before the 25th, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Um, and uh, we'll talk to you right before the new year. Hope you're getting that home field advantage. Christmas, <laughs> or sorry, home field uh, apparel. <laughs> Christmas gift. I know yeah. my parents are. We're going to see what their reactions are. But <laughs> yes, happy holidays. Happy new year. And have a safe one. I hope everyone can get every, anywhere they need to be. All the crazy winter storms. So stay warm. And... Yeah, make sure to get your cow gifts in. And with that, as always, go Bears. Go Bears.